Landmines are a major threat to human life in many parts of the world, with over 80 nations facing this danger. Cambodia is one such country. It's estimated that one in every 230 people in Cambodia has been disabled by landmines laid during past conflicts. Even though the wars ended over 30 years ago, landmines and other types of unexploded ordnance remain scattered across nearly half of the country. The most prevalent type of landmine is the anti-personnel mine, lying dormant underground, waiting for an unfortunate encounter to trigger the delivery of its devastating payload maiming and killing innocent people. With millions of these explosive devices present, it may take up to 300 years to clear them all. This small two-story house in the town of Siam Reap now serves as a residence for a group of heroes who assist in defusing landmines. The house is home to a small team of 13. They're cared for like pets, with each member of the team given a name and their own individual enclosure. They sleep on comfortable straw beds inside a big clay pot and have wooden sticks as toys to channel their original instincts. But everyone has name, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. They have uh, their names, they have cheap number, they have uh, birth date, sex, and... Uh, so uh, this uh, is Frederick? This is Frederick. So if, that means that with this cheap number, it's only for Frederick. If there is another Frederick, then we have another cheap number. Ah. Maybe, the, the Apopo, a non-profit organization, operates the Hero Rats program, which trains Gambian pouched rats to detect landmines. This initiative began in Africa. It starts by selecting young rats about four weeks old from the forest. They are trained to familiarize them with humans and to detect TNT, or trinitrotoluene, the explosive compound found in landmines, which are prevalent in significant numbers across Angola and Mozambique. Their eyesight is not really good, so most of the time, even in the wild, they are living finding food because of their uh, high capacity of sniffing. Because uh, they are most blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they are, they are, their capacity of sniffing is very good. And that's why for us it was easier just tuning from, I mean, using the advantage of uh, high capacity of, of sniffing, just tuning to put our target that we want. So when they sniff TNT, we give food. So, these giant rats have a lifespan of approximately eight years and can grow up to three feet long. They are calm and friendly, despite having poor eyesight, but possess exceptional olfactory skills. Since they are raised from a young age without exposure to the wild, their lives revolve solely around training, scent detection of explosives and food. As I said, they're coming from the wild. Uh -huh. so we, we want them to be friendly. Right. Yeah, so that our work can be easier. Otherwise, if they're aggressive, if they are normally in the wild, then it's not easy to work with them. As you know that we have to clean the cages, we have to take them out for uh, a walk, short walk sometimes, like exercising them. Uh -huh. We have to train them in a mind phase. So if they are afraid of um, environments, then it's not easy. And I'm sure that even the performance will go down. What makes them suitable as mine detectors as opposed to dogs, despite not being as well known as dogs, is that they have a sensitive nose, like dogs, but are smaller and weigh less. They're easy to raise and they have simple dietary needs. So you mean if I, if you take her out now yeah. and place here, yeah. if there's a normal rat that would run around like sure. crazy, sure. but not... No, this one they will not. Can you try it again? Yeah. Hello, Beatrice. I'm sorry, I have to wake you up. You have to come and say hi to Thai people. <laughs> oh gosh, really? So they will stay close to you? Yeah. When they call the name? So 
sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the no, no. Beer twist? Yeah, yeah. Did she recognize her name? No. Oh, no. okay. They don't know. And even when, when you call them, they will not uh, respond to their name. So we're just giving them just to control the performance. Ah, and okay. Other things. They work much faster than humans, around five to six times faster. These rats can search for explosives in a 100 square meter area in less than 20 minutes, while it would take humans three to four days. For one rat to be trained full content to be uh, nine months to one year. Nine months to one be year? Taken, yeah. If a rat is very, very clever, then nine months can be full content. The rats are lightweight, less than 1.5 kilograms, which is well below the threshold of 5 kilograms required to trigger an anti-personnel landmine. Therefore, the explosives don't pose a threat to them. It's very light. Yeah. And they should yeah. be, because uh, if they are too heavy, then it, their performance also sometimes may mm. decrease, because they are working in order to get food. So if they are full before they go to the work... So you have to control their weight too? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they didn't grow up together, then if you mix it up, they fight. Oh, really? They fight. So you cannot mix them up? No. Oh. If you mix them up, they fight. I see. So they only associate with human beings? Yeah. Previously, there were doubts about the efficiency of the rats compared to bomb detectors and humans. Their remarkable ability to detect the odor of TNT has, however, finally been widely acknowledged. With the successes achieved in Africa, Apopo expanded its operations beyond the continent, starting in Cambodia in April 2015. Cambodia is one of the countries with the highest number of anti-personnel landmines in the world. In the rural border areas, every square meter is filled with danger, particularly along the northwestern border of Cambodia, adjacent to Surin province in Thailand. It is the region with the densest concentration of anti-personnel mines in the country. This area was the final stronghold of the Khmer Rouge before their defeat by Heng Samrin's government. After the war, Villagers had to navigate cautiously through forests and devastated areas to transform the battleground into arable land. As a result, approximately 20,000 people have lost their lives and another 44,000 have been maimed in landmine explosions. On average, an incident involving a landmine occurs every two and a half days in Cambodia. Therefore, when unsure about the level of mine contamination in an area to be cultivated or cleared, villagers notify the demining teams. Under scorching sunlight, we followed the small team of mine clearing members who had gathered together today with a total of 11 rats. One team member informed us that if they have to work in hot and intense sunlight continuously, the rats need to have sunscreen applied before going to work. Before entering the actual field, however, we had to receive essential information and safety protocols to which we must strictly adhere when we are in the field. This ensured the safety of all living beings in the area. The boxes that no highlight is been unclear area. Mm, okay. The area here is no highlight, it's mean unclear. These colored wooden sticks serve as symbols to indicate the level of safety in the area. For example, an area that has been surveyed and cleared of landmines will have white-tipped sticks to signify safety. If there are still red-tipped sticks with skull and crossbones symbols, it means it's a dangerous area and entry is strictly prohibited. The team conducted a practice session to ensure our understanding and they provided us with bomb suits, helmets, and masks for our safety. This is a suit designed to protect against anti-personnel mines, emphasizing maximum coverage of the abdomen and chest. If we encounter an actual explosive, we may survive, because vital organs in the torso are protected, but losing limbs is inevitable. 
The mine clearing operations here start with heavy and safe machinery, like bulldozers, used to remove obstructing trees. Once the area is clear, the human demining team marks out a rectangular grid using red ropes to facilitate thorough inspection. Then one person stands on each side holding onto the rope, while a rat handler attaches a rat to the other end. The rat is released to follow the rope until it reaches the end. When the rat reaches the rope, the handler on that side moves about 50 centimeters to the side and the rat is allowed to walk back in the opposite direction. The handler on the other side does the same, moving about 50 centimeters to the side. This process continues until the entire designated area has been covered, ensuring precise and detailed inspection of every square inch. When these rats detect the scent of TNT, they stop and scratch the ground to signal the team. The team members then place white markers to indicate the location. It is then the responsibility of the human team members to proceed with the mine clearance. Okay, you train them. If they find TNT, they get food. If Isaac would have got landmine now, right now, he get food right away? No. After? Uh, we, because uh, if the Isaac starts to scratch now, we don't know if it's mine or not. Oh, okay. And then if we get reward in the real minefield, it means we make the wrong thing. Because mm -hmm. we, uh, if the rat, the, the, the Isaac starts to scratch here, and we don't know if it's the mine or anything else. Mm. Otherwise, we don't reward it. Mm -hmm. We don't give the food. Although this time we didn't have the opportunity to witness firsthand a rat finding an explosive, it is still a joyful moment for everyone, including the rats, the demining team, and the local community. It signifies that no one has to risk their life or organs, and the area is free from landmines ready for cultivation and the making of a livelihood. The demining team informed us that prior to our arrival, these rats had found three explosive devices. All of them were manufactured in China. According to statistics from 2015, these rats had cleared and returned 7,302,972 square meters of land to the people of Cambodia. They have detected and cleared 14,939 explosive devices and other weapons that were found but hadn't detonated yet. Before becoming a demining team, these rats undergo intensive training. The average cost of training a rat is around 7,000 US dollars, which is much lower than training a human. And these rats? What we are seeing here already passed the test. Yeah, they passed their tests uh, in Tanzania. And once they get to the country where they, they, are, they are going, again, they have to be tested with, a, with, a, with a minor authorities from that uh, country. We took them to Mozambique. Apart from the test that they did in Tanzania, they were tested again in Mozambique. If they fail, then they cannot go to the operation. Oh my God, it's a lot of work for them. A lot of it, a lot of it. So it's test, test, test everywhere, test, test. These rats work to detect and locate explosives regularly from Mondays to Saturdays, with Sundays off for rest and relaxation. They have a working lifespan of about seven years, or possibly even shorter if they show a reluctance to work. After retirement, they lead a peaceful life with their trainers and enjoy delicious bananas. What what you doing with them when they retire? I would just keep them like this until they die. Because they, they are your pet, they're working for you, yeah, they're yeah. hero. Yes, yes. So it's not fair to take and throw it away. For the demining team, these rats are more than just rats. They are like family. They are true heroes who assist in saving lives. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you.
Besides these hero rats, another memorable member of the demining team is Aki Ra, a former Khmer Rouge soldier who trained to become an expert in activating explosive devices to harm others. He buried thousands of landmines during the war to block the opposing side and to protect himself. Over time, the devastating impact of the landmines, which continue to threaten people's lives indiscriminately, led him to become a D-miner himself. He was stolen from his family when he was five. He became a child soldier when he was 10 years old. He fought with the Khmer Rouge or with the Cambodian army until the United Nations came here in the early 1990s. And then he went to work for the United Nations clearing landmines. And he worked for a couple of French groups. He realized doing that, that he was very, very good at this. Um, so he decided he wanted to go back to the villages where he had fought as a child and dig up some of the landmines that he'd put in the ground. Why did he do that to pay off what he has done? Exactly. He was trying to, he was trying to make those places safe that he had made unsafe. And he wanted to make up for the bad he had done in his life. No one knows the exact locations of those silent killers better than those who buried them with their own hands. Apart from landmines, a variety of war ordnance, which is still lurking, have also been recovered by him. He says he wants to make his country safe for his people. When I first met him, I said, how are you going to do that? He said, I'm going to clear landmines. And I said, how long? And he looked at me like I was stupid. And he said, until my country is safe for my people. To raise awareness of the horrors of war, Aki has collected enough artifacts to create a modest-sized museum in the town of Samriel. We were bombing Cambodia during my, when I graduated from high school 50 years ago. And those bombs and that, that fighting that it created are still blowing people up here. So we need to go back and clean up the mess we left behind. At the end of World War II, we cleared 95 million landmines in Europe in about six or seven years. We've been working 25 years in Cambodia to clear three or four million landmines. And there may not even be that many, but we can't get the money to put the people on the ground to clear it because they're not blowing people up in, in Europe or North America or Australia. From Cambodia, we sent a team across the globe back to the homeland of these rats. Mozambique is a country located on the southeastern coast of Africa. It suffered a brutal civil war from 1977 to 1992, resulting in a large number of landmines being buried throughout the region. Similar to Cambodia, Mozambique has seen significant loss of life, injuries and disabilities caused by these landmines. Landmines posed a barrier to the livelihoods of the general population in Mozambique. The war and its aftermath contributed to the country's extreme poverty, ranking it among the world's most impoverished nations. In 1992, the prolonged civil war finally ended, and the Mozambican government, with assistance from European NGOs, began the process of demining using armoured vehicles, tanks, bomb detectors, and notably, rats. 23 years later, the last explosive in Mozambique was successfully cleared. The Mozambican government declared the country mine-free. The mission of these rats is, however, not yet over. Their exceptional scent detection skills have been expanded to sniff out diseases, especially for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. The tuberculosis situation in Mozambique is severe to the extent that the government has declared it a national emergency. Tuberculosis, or TB, is a contagious disease that claims the lives of approximately 1.5 million people globally each year. It's predominantly found in low-income or developing countries, and half of the infected individuals remain undiagnosed through general screenings. Every day, a Popo Research Center staff, along with sample collection boxes, use motorcycles to patrol clinics throughout the city, including Maputo, to collect phlegm specimens from patients seeking diagnosis and treatment at the clinics. Typically, when patients visit the clinic and the doctor suspects they may have TB, 
specialized staff members examine the phlegm specimens under a microscope to detect the presence of the bacteria. Half of the examinations, however, yield negative results, leading to patients being sent home with a non-infectious diagnosis. This further contributes to the spread of the bacteria to others. Apopo's staff members will take the phlegm specimens collected from the clinics back to the laboratory for further analysis. Beforehand, the specimens will undergo heat treatment for the safety of both staff members and the rats involved. The staff will then arrange the specimens on a tray before placing them inside a glass cabinet for the rats to sniff. Each rat will sniff 10 samples at a time. If a specimen contains tuberculosis bacteria, the rat will spend more time sniffing it. The staff members who observe and record the rat's behavior will trigger a sound to signal the rat to come to the side of the cabinet for a reward of mashed banana mixed with avocado, delivered through a tube. The staff will use the food in the tube as a measure of each rat's performance. If there's leftover food on any given day, it indicates relatively low performance. If two or more rats detect the presence of tuberculosis in a specimen, the staff will notify the clinic that the patient's test results are positive for TB. On any given day, these rats can sniff up to 100 phlegm specimens. After the initial training, the rat is training all the time, because if we don't train the rat, the rat will forget about the 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 smell and the and the conditioning and everything. So every day we should be, uh, be giving them more uh, training and uh, more rewards on, on specific samples to keep them going on. Uh, so the rats, if we stop uh, uh, giving them reward, uh, they last three, four days in forgetting everything. This collaborative work between the laboratory and the clinic improves the speed and accuracy of TB screening. Normally, examining a hundred phlegm specimens on slides under a microscope would take at least two days, whereas the rats take less than half an hour. In May 2015, the laboratory rats detected tuberculosis in over 10,000 phlegm specimens, which had initially been deemed negative by the clinic. Okay, a rat uh, indicates approximately between 30 and 40 percent of the samples that we present them. And uh, approximately 25 to 30 percent of these samples are positive, are proven positive. Uh, this does not mean uh, that uh, the other are negative. So uh, the only thing we are doing is to uh, uh, verify that the bacteria is in the samples. For the staff here, these rats are not small and bothersome creatures. On the contrary, they are highly skilled assistants and a new ray of hope for countless tuberculosis patients in this country. Having had the opportunity to witness their stories, it is truly awe-inspiring and commendable to see how these seemingly insignificant and bothersome little creatures are being utilized to bring benefits to humanity. For those who have survived the dangers of both explosions and tuberculosis over the past years, these rats are heroes. They are certainly more than just rats.